Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm here with Kevin Brand of Synopsys and Dinesh Savaraj from Infineon. Going to talk today about software-defined vehicles. We've gone through several major architectural shifts in automotive as they started becoming more electrified, as we started getting more intelligence into the vehicles, more AI, more autonomy. What's changed? What's different about software-defined vehicles? Yeah, I mean, what's different here is really a service-oriented sort of product, right? So the only way to really deliver different services and differentiating services to have much more software definition. It's also about separating hardware from software. It means truly having a hardware agnostic software stack and having the ability to run that on generalized compute inside the vehicle itself. It enables you to deliver differentiating features via software only. There's no need to sort of upgrade hardware to do that. And this is very different from hardware software co-design, right? Because it's not just one platform that you're trying to optimize completely. It's now this is sort of generalized approach where you can update it as you go. Yes, that's right. This service-based product, so a service-based architecture. It's a lot to do with just delivering those features to be able to, say, update them over the air if need be, dynamically. You need an infrastructure and a software framework to work within in the vehicle to be able to deliver that. And Dinesh, from the Infineon standpoint, Infineon's been making chips for automotive for years. What is, what's the impact of this? So from our point of view, software-defined vehicle, people are moving away from traditional hardware-centric approaches. And the software is becoming a very crucial uh, part in enabling every advanced functionalities of future car and also to drive a huge innovation in the industry. So unlike in the past, now the whole vehicle is going to be dependent on the sophisticated software system to control and manage each and every aspect of the vehicle operations. For example, safety, connectivity, autonomous driving, to improve user experience, to do the energy management and to do a performance optimization. So in, in essence, everything tomorrow is going to be controlled by software. Let's take a closer look. Kevin, what are we looking at? Here's really a statement of what the software-defined vehicle really means for development right through to deployment and test. So, I mean, we're really looking at increased software complexity, a huge increase in actually lines of code. More software means more tests. More tests means more coverage and more cost. So what we're looking at here is a sort of framework, a virtual hardware framework, if you like, which software can be developed on and deployed virtually on a server rather than having to do lots of hardware bench testing. So it's really a transition from people on benches to automated tests in overnight regression on servers, obviously for the benefits of time to market, cost savings, scalability of, of testing. And that all comes from the large test coverage demands of software-defined vehicles. So really what you're doing here is creating sort of a higher abstraction level for an ECU, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. If we look at this with reference, there's a number of different abstraction levels that are possible. And it's all really, again, about developing software, about testing software. So everything in the software stack from the application level, middleware, OS, drivers, and really there's not one type of virtual ECU that does everything. You know, high-speed application simulations are really useful, say, at the level one that you see there. As you start introducing more and more of the software, you're getting more and more details. The difference between the left-hand side and the right-hand side here, of course, is the fact that the SIL or the software in the loop is taking your target code and it's compiling it on the host and you're simulating your application level. The difference on the right-hand side, the level four, if you like, is you're taking your target code and you're compiling it all as, as if it would be on the real board. So the level four is really a model of hardware that's actually executing software. The SIL is really a software model. It's very different abstraction levels. Obviously, for testing hardware-dependent software, level four is the way to go. If you just want to test high-level applications at really high speed, 
level one and two is probably a good choice. Depending on the needs of the software, you have to choose your virtually see you carefully, at least choose the abstraction carefully. What do these different levels actually do? What do they look like when you really drill down? If you look at level four, for instance, a level 4B, which is really a model of the hardware. If we look at this middle part here, it's more than just a model because you need a model of the hardware, but you also need infrastructure and tooling that instruments that. So what I mean is, you know, you run your software on the model, but how do you know it's working? Well, you need scripting to analyze it. You need charts, you need results. I mean, you need ways of extracting the software states. You need to debug it. So there's a lot of tooling that goes around the model that sort of facilitates that. Dinesh, do you want to add to that? Sure, Kevin. So in addition to the hardware, the traces, it's also important to debug the software as is. So we want to make sure the virtual prototype does not require to change any tooling that software validation teams are traditionally used to. Given this, the standard software debuggers are going to be um, seamlessly working along with the virtual prototype, which enables the debugging of the software that is being simulated on the CPU, which is inside virtual prototype. And there are a variety of software debuggers that we support for different heterogeneous cores that are within a virtual prototype. On the other side, we understand the MCU-centric virtual prototype is not good enough to achieve the big picture of the simulation. In order to scale this up to the ECU or collection of ECU, it is important to make sure that it supports network simulation using automotive protocols like CAN, Ethernet, LAN, etc. And to achieve that, the connectivity to the other tools via co-simulation interface is important. Some of the tools that are supported can be Vector Kano or MATLAB's uh, simulink, uh, simulation platform. We've taken this from a high level of abstraction here, but this has really significant tangible results in the supply chain, right? So in the next slide, I would like to show you how this virtual prototype is deployed across value chain to increase the value of the virtual simulation across the industry. So we as MCU supplier is responsible to provide the MCU virtual prototype. For this purpose, we have partnered closely with uh, Synopsys and we work as a single center of excellence and we jointly invest together to create both platforms and the debugging capabilities around that. And that is being supplied to the ecosystem and tool partners of Infineon in order to promote preparation of the early software and tools that are compatible to the new architecture. Kevin, let's go back a second here. What does this actually mean to the supply chain? Well, what it really means is that we have to fit with the supply chain of, you know, the semi to the tier one to the OEM. Because we've partnered with Infineon, we can create a virtual MCU in the same way that that supply chain from Infineon enables the tier one with hardware, we enable the tier one with virtual hardware. So their software stack, along with tier two software frameworks, et cetera, they can all be developed by the tier one with the virtual solution, building up a virtual ECU. So building on top of the MCU. This, of course, means that the OEM, when they choose a tier one, they can also get a virtual ECU from that tier one. So it's really about echoing the real hardware supply chain, except you're supplying it with models in parallel with the hardware. Of course, at the OEM, they might be getting multiple ECUs from different vendors, so they would get multiple virtual ECUs. And, and they're much more at the vehicle level by combining the virtual ECUs together and, and then doing actually the full SDV verification at the top level. So if I'm hearing this correctly, two fundamental things have changed. First, we've taken some of the advancements that we've had in the regular chip industry outside of automotive and said, OK, we can develop software as we develop the hardware, even before it's the hardware is ready. The second thing is this is really mm -hmm. the first time it's being applied into a safety critical application, right? Yes, actually, it's kind of changed the processes for software and hardware verification and very early concept phases has changed quite significantly, even at the semiconductor level. So we engage, of course, down at the lowest level. Dinesh, you'd be better talking about how it's impacting your own development processes. Yes, those old and traditional approaches are gone where the software has to uh, follow the hardware. So in the today's era, it is important to have code development or code design of both hardware and software together. 
clear to that, it's important to make sure the system is conceptualized to suit the uh, new evolving requirements in terms of functionality and performance. And here, the, the virtual prototype is heavily used. Unlike the past, people don't want to settle with the spreadsheet-based analysis. The, sp uh, the virtual prototype is created, which is consisting of slightly high fidelity models in terms of accuracy. And that brings closer representation of the system that is being built, uh, using which the performance and the bandwidth related questions can be answered, which would help to find the right fit for the hardware solutions. On the other hand, the same virtual prototype with slightly lower details, uh, it means more functionality and less accuracy can be used by the software teams in order to evaluate the suitability and sufficiency of the new hardware features for the software explorations. And after the conceptualization is done, then comes the full-blown virtual prototype development, which mimics the hardware assets in terms of hardware software interface, in terms of address mapping, a lot of mapping, interrupt mapping, and so on. And this is very important to enable SOC verification and validation activity by front-loading the test preparation. So it is very important to make sure that the whole test environment and test patterns are fully available prior to the availability of the DOT, which can be SOC RTL or can be the silicon. So this is where the virtual prototype helps us to front-load the activities of the SOC verification and validation preparation. On other hand, this is you know bread and butter use case of the virtual prototype, where the software development and validation can be started in parallel to the hardware with the help of virtual prototype, and this has a direct impact on time to market. The real impetus behind this is that things are changing so quickly in automotive that just to be able to keep up, you need to build this kind of architecture in here, right? You think about the old. Uh, development cycle. It used to be five years, seven years, and now we're down to sometimes months. And we have to make sure that it works. We have to have the flexibility and we have to have competitive ability to change as we go. And we need to make sure that the supply chain is full, unlike what we encountered for probably most of the early 2020s, right? Yeah, certainly. As you said, the, the design cycle comes down to months. With the SDV cycles, what we're looking at is updates over the air, which means really CICD, continuous integration, continuous development. So features can be delivered and tested, you know, continuously. And that's a massive change for the automotive industry. So indeed, to be able to test virtually in large regression is the only way to do that. You just could not cycle that kind of features through on hardware, hardware benches. There's also another aspect, which is about the deep value chain uh, that is involved within the software industry in automotive so there are too many players and they have got stake in it and uh, when we talk about software defined vehicle which requires continuous improvement uh, of the software features or the rather the vehicles feature using the software over decades of maintenance requirement obviously it's important to create a digital twin representation of the complete vehicle and which is capable of executing the the software that comes from different parties across the value chain and this is really just the beginning, right? Because now you can do things like once it, once a structure is in place, you can add in digital twins. You can migrate this to different industries. You can do all sorts of things you couldn't do before because it was pretty much a linear process. Yes, that's right. I mean, it, it's quite typical to combine these things in terms of creating something like a digital twin, combining these things with environment simulators, mechanical simulators, and bringing the whole thing together. So yeah, it's quite common to see that now. It needs to needs to happen that way. And it reduces the driving cost because taking a car out for a drive nowadays, um, especially in under test, you know, is an expensive thing to do. So doing that virtually is really the key. Kevin Brand and Dinesh Savraj, thanks for a great explanation. Thank you. Thank you.